Thank you for joining everyone out there in the Lighthouse Project and everyone here. Nisha Torah. Tonight, we're going to be discussing a fascinating topic on the Parsha, one that I almost guarantee you've never heard before. And I'll tell you how this year came about. I was teaching at Miva Seretzion, the yeshiva post high school in Yerushalayim, and I had a boy come to me that was just getting into learning Torah. And he asked me a question, Rebbe, what should I learn? That was his big question. And he thought I was going to give him some chassidah, some maral, some ramchal. I said, have you ever learned the Torah? Have you ever read through the Bible? Have you ever read through the Bible? And he said, oh, I've learned a few parashiyos here and there. I've never actually read cover to cover. So I told him, there's a book that was given to us by God. It is the basis of everything we believe in. And you have not read it from cover to cover. Now, it's pretty sad, but I myself had not read from cover to cover until I was 20 years old. Cover to cover, every single word, Shnai Mikra, full year, until I was 20 years old. And for many Yidin, that's actually the sad truth. We haven't read through the entire Torah ever, especially not all of Tanakh, okay? There's not so many books. I mean, the Chamishi Chumshe Torah are about 200 pages. It's not so intense. So I said, read through, go through the whole Torah. So he went through, and he finished Sefer Bereshis. And he came to me, and he asked me a very important question. And he said, what is the point of Yitzhak Avinu? Very brazen question. What is the point of Yitzhak Avinu? So what do you mean by that? And he said, Yitzhak doesn't really do anything. And I said, what do you mean he doesn't do anything? It was Yaked Yitzhak. And he said, well, that was really Avram Avinu's test. He was more of a supporting actor. And I said, well, there was the whole fight of the Bechorah between Yaakov and Esav. And he says, again, that was their fight. Yitzhak was a supporting actor that almost ruined everything. He's a feeble old man that they're just trying to trick. So I said, well, you know what? You're a little bit right. Let's think, what else did he do? Well, he dug wells. Very impressive. Interesting enough, he didn't even dig wells. He redug the exact same wells that Avraham had already dug. Furthermore, it says that he gave them the exact same names that Avraham had given them. So when it comes to the wells, he really didn't do anything at all. He just read dug wells. Okay, so what else happened? He met Avimelech the king and said that Rivka was his sister and she was taken by Avimelech. So again, does that story ring a bell? The exact same thing that happened to Avram Avinu. And nothing really came about. Okay, story number three. He planted a field and he reaped a hundredfold harvest. Also, not so impressive. Ah, Avram. So, what is Yitzhak's life all about? You have Avram Avinu that has 10 tests. You have Avram Avinu that's out in the world doing Kiruv, that's saving Lot, that's fighting kings. He has a very exciting story, Avram Avinu. Next, what do you have? You have Yaakov Avinu. Yaakov Avinu is fighting Esau, battling angels, stealing the bracha, or going to get the And Yaakov Avinu goes down to the house of Lavan. <laughs> And the question is, why is Yitzhak so passive? Why does Yitzhak do absolutely nothing? What is the sort of Yitzhak? He's a very mysterious, enigmatic, biblical character. And there's not much written about him. But today we're going to go through the source sheet or to discover a completely different picture of what Yitzhak was all about. And the place in which we're going to begin is a very fascinating subject is that Yitzhak Avinu, in his old age, became blind. And we know that in this week's parasha, that's how this entire story with Yaakov and Esau came about, because Yitzhak could not see. He was blind. Now, first of all, I'll tell you a keyword. Anytime the Torah tells you that someone had a physical impairment, it's not just there to speak bad about them, to tell you that they looked a certain way. It's coming to teach you a secret about the essence of the person. If the Torah felt the need to mention it, there's something deeper that it's coming to tell us. So what is it that it's coming to teach us here? So it, Torah says that Yitzhak was blind. He got old and he became blind. How did Yitzhak become blind? So everybody probably learned when they were in kindergarten, first grade, second grade, there's a lot of stories. It's pretty interesting. In fact, I gathered here in sources one through six, no less than seven reasons that Yitzhak was blind. Seven different reasons. What are the seven reasons? 
So here we'll do it outside a little bit. Reason number one, brought by Rashi. It was the smoke from the Avodah Zara of Esav's wives. The smoke was so intense in his house, it made him blind. Why did Rivka not become blind? Good question. But Yitzhak became blind. Number two, angel tears. Those acidic, dangerous angel tears. What happened? So the Midrash says that Yitzhak Avinu was sitting by the Akedah. Avram Avinu was about to shecht him. The angels look down from Shemayim. They start to cry, and the tears go into Yitzhak's eyes. And Yitzhak becomes blinded. That's reason number two. Reason number three, says Rashi, that it's so Yaakov could get the bracha. It was natural blindness, it sounds like. Hashem made him blind so that this whole story could eventually play out. Reason number four, the Midrash says that when Yitzhak Avinu was tied down, so he actually was so davuk and connected to Hashem in that moment of mysterious nefesh, of giving over his life for Hashem, that the clouds opened up and he saw the Shekhinah. And when you see the Shekhinah, you're not supposed to see the Shekhinah and live. So instead of dying, he became blind. That was reason number four. He was blind because he saw the Shekhinah. Reason number five, brought in the Talmud, is a crazy one, because he saw the face of Esav HaRasha. Because when you look at a Russia, you become blind. That's what the Gemara says. You look at a Russia and you become blind. So you look at Ace of a Russia. Reason number five. Sorry, reason number six. This is in the Midrash, source number five. Why do you become blind? Because Hashem had Rahmanas on him. Hashem had mercy on him. He didn't want Yitzhak to have to see how wicked Asa really was. So he made him blind. Because he said, Yitzhak's going to go out into the Shuk. Everyone's going to see him and say, that's the father of that wicked man. So he said, if I make him blind, he'll stay at home. And you won't have to see all the bad things they is doing. Reason number six, and the last one, the Zohar says that at the time of the Akedah Yitzhak, Yitzhak's neshama was taken all the way up to the Kisei covered, And at the Kisei covered, it was so much intense Kedusha that when he came back down, he was blind. Okay. Seven different reasons of why Yitzhak became blind. Okay. Another lesson to learn from this. Whenever the Midrashim give you seven reasons for one matter, and it doesn't even seem like it's something so important, right? Who really cares why Yitzhak became blind? The only reason the story even mentions it is to tell us why he couldn't tell the difference between Esav and Yaakov. So again, the Torah is telling you that there's something very deep happening here. Why else would it give you seven reasons? And generally, when we have seven reasons for anything, and they're all brought in the deeper sources, we have a principle that Eilu ve'elu divrei l'kim chaim. They're all true. And they're not mutually exclusive. They're all true. So the Torah felt the need to give us seven reasons Asa became blind, that Yitzhak became blind. And all of them are different. And they're all true. And they all happened at different points of Yitzhak's life, if you've noticed. Some were at the Akedah. Some was when he became older. Some was when Asa became married. So what's happening here? How can we put all seven together in a unified theory of Yitzhak's blindness, that's also going to hopefully shed light on understanding what is the point of Yitzhak? Why was he so passive? Why does it seem like he had no mission in life like the other of us? Those are our questions. Clear? Good. Good. Okay. So moving into source number seven. Now we're going to explore Yitzhak Avinu. We're going to try to understand who was this unbelievable tzaddik, one of the of us, and why was he so different from Avraham and Yitzhak, and what are we actually supposed to take away from all of this? So it's pretty fascinating. Now, al Sheikh says in source number seven that why did Hashem wait until Avraham was 100 years old to have Yitzhak Avinu, until Sarah was 90? Why did Hashem feel the need to wait so long? So the al Sheikh says something unbelievable. He says that Yitzhak was going to come out and be born so holy that he couldn't be born through natural means. Why is it? Because when a woman gives birth in a natural way, so there's a certain tumah of impurity that's associated with that birth. And when the baby gets infected, so to speak, with that impurity, so when he comes out of the womb, he forgets all the Torah that the Gemara says he learns in the womb with an angel. Not only that, but when a father is in his youth and he gives birth to a child, since he still has taiva for women at that age, so the child is born with that taiva. It's ultimately going to come to fruition when he gets older. But if he's born when the father is already 100 years old and all of that has dissipated, so then the child is actually born without that type. So he says, the Ashok says, that Yitzhak was born Kulo Tahor. He was born completely pure. He says he was an Ola Tamima, a perfect korban, and that he had no Yetzirah in source eight. He was born without a Yetzirah. 
quite fascinating. The only person, I think, in the entire Torah that we've ever seen that's born without a Yitzhahara. First of all, it begs a very big question. That's the obvious question. What? Bechira. Bechira. <laughs> the whole purpose of being in this world is to be placed on a 50-50 scale with free choice and to have to fight your Yitzhahara. That's the name of the game. How could you create an individual that doesn't even have a Yitzhahara? It doesn't make any sense. How would you create an individual like that? Sure. Yeah, for sure. Yitzhak never had a taiva. That's what it says. Never had a taiva to sin. He was born Kulo Tahar from the day he was born. Yeah, yeah it would be like on that level of Tzadik. But look at source number nine. Look at source number nine, okay? It says something fascinating. Both of the Avos outside of Yitzhak, meaning Avram and Yaakov, we know that Hashem changed their names. Avram, who is now called Abraham, was originally Avram without the hay, as you know, Avram. Right? Yaakov got his name changed to Yisrael. Yitzhak stays flat, stays Yitzhak. Why do you not need a change? So what's a name? So look what, look what else it says. It also says that Hashem gave Yitzhak his name before he was born. The Torah says that he told Avraham to name his child Yitzhak. It was one of the four people in history that were given their name before they were born. The Gemara lists four. Yitzhak is one of these people. So what does that mean? So you should know, this is just a fascinating tidbit, side point, is that what is a name? So the Maral says that a name represents the essence of a person. A name represents his mission in this world, which is why when your parents give you your name, so Chazal say that the mother gets Ruach HaKodesh. Mother and father, they get Ruach HaKodesh. Why do they need Ruach HaKodesh to give a name? It's not so hard to just give a name, pick a name. Because the name has to define the essence of the person. It defines his mission in the world. So much so that when a person is sick, what do we do to them? Shino Hashem. We give them a new name. We add the name of Fall. We add a name to them. Why do we do that? Because it could be that we're worried that their mission in the world has come to an end. The mission that was associated with their name has come to an end. So what do we do? We give them another name, which is really a code word for a new mission. A name is a mission. A new mission. Now they'll remain in the world for a longer period of time. Another example is there's great individuals throughout history that had many names. One of them, Moshe Rabbeinu. The Gemara says he had seven names. Pretty silly. How are you going to communicate with someone that has seven names? You never know who he's talking to. But why does someone need seven names? So it means that Moshe had so much potential. He was such a great individual that he actually had seven missions in this world. After he completed each one, so he was given a new mission. And so he actually was able to contain within himself seven different names. So the name is the essence of the person. What does it mean when Hashem gives a person a name before they're even born and that their name is never changed? It means that they didn't really have a mission, or the mission was already accomplished before they ever got here. When, when, when a parent gives the name, when a child's already in the world. So he's basically saying, now that you're here, this is your mission. Go fight. Okay. When you're given the name before you're even born, it's almost like his mission was already there, was already accomplished. His name has never even changed. Like all the other others, that they had something that they elevated to a new status. It sounds like Yitzhak stayed status quo for his entire life. He didn't really do anything, right? He didn't really do anything. So what's the story? What, what are we supposed to understand? What, what is so unique about Yitzhak? Uh, they had this unique task in the world, this purpose in the world. So if you look at source number 10, next section, dead man walking. These are, these are very, very deep sources, by the way. You're not going to find these in your, in your regular art scrolls, okay? These are very deep things. So we'll try to understand this to the best of our ability. But the Alshech says, Vayeshev Avram, it says Vayeshev Avram, that after the Akedah, it says that Avram returned in the singular. Now there's a problem because someone else is with him. Was there? Yitzhak Avinu. Right? Yitzhak was with Avram. Why does it say when he came down from the mountain, he came by himself? So the Ashok says, the Pirke Derbe Liezer, he's putting Pirke Derbe Liezer, she Yitzhak halach legan eidid lehis rapos ima shehechla hasakin lachtoch. The Yitzhak actually went to Gan Eden for three years after the Akedah until he met Rivka. Went to Gan Eden for three years. Pretty fascinating. An individual that after the Akeda went straight to Gan Eden and lived there for three years. Gan Eden. Right? It's very interesting about Yitzchak. Yitzchak Vinu. Okay. What else do we know about Yitzchak Vinu? The Ramami Pano, source number 11. He says it's as if Yitzchak was shechted and was burned. What does that mean? He says that if the Akeda is Yitzchak, Yitzchak's neshama left his body. And he explains something that every person has two neshamas. He has a neshama illa and a neshama tata. What does that mean? 
He has a higher neshama and a lower neshama. His higher neshama is the ideal human being that he can become. It's the perfect him. The lower neshama is what he exists as in this world. And what's the goal of life? To bring the two into equilibrium, right? It says when the angels were coming up and down the ladder in Yaakov Inu's dream, what were they doing? They were looking at the Yaakov up there and the Kisei Kaba and the Yaakov down here and they couldn't believe that they were exactly the same. Because Yaakov Inu had become that person. Yeah. So we reached the potential. So the two neshamas had a line. So, yeah, yeah. This is, there's even more, even within the divine soul, saying there's a divine soul that's already perfected. There's a divine soul down here that we have to work on. So now Rami Pano says that Yitzhak actually only had the upper soul. At the Akira Yitzhak, his soul left him, and the only one that came down was its upper soul, which means that Yitzhak was living in this world with a neshama that was already in the next world. He was living a reality in this world as if he was already up there. Fascinating. The Zohar in the next source, source number 12, says something also that adds to this point. It says that whenever Hashem called out to a tzaddik, he always said his name twice. Right? Moshe, Moshe, Yaakov, Yaakov, Avram, Avram, Noach, Noach. Right? There's always a double lasha. Why? Because he's talking to the two neshamas. He's talking to the one up there and he's talking to the one down here. Except, look what it says, the Zohar says, Chutz mi Yitzchak. He did not say it with Yitzhak. Why? That when he was on the Mizbeach, his soul left his body. The soul of this world left his body. Right? And then it says back in the bold, And the Zara says he only got his Neshama back from Olam Haba. And then it says, that's why He was like a dead person. He was a dead man walking. He had no existence in the physical world. Yitzhak was a tzaddik that was on such a high level. And he didn't have a mission down here. We just saw sources there. He, was, he wasn't born at the Yitzhak. He was like a malach guy? Almost like a malach. He knew all the Torah that he learned from the, in his mother's womb. He was born from a miraculous birth that had no impurity associated with it. He had an ashama from the next world. It was from Olam Haba. He had an Olam Haba in Olam Hazer. And it says in the last source, that there's two reasons why Hashem refers to Yitzchak in his lifetime as if he's already dead. The Rabbanon said, because his ashes are in a mound on the Mizbeach, because it was like he was killed by the Akedah. Why? Because he was so willing to give up his life. Beratzon, he gave up his life. He was Neshcha. We get Schar from Yitzchak Avinu as if he was actually sacrificed because he wanted it so badly. It's as if he did it in a spiritual sense. Then Rabbi Brachia says, it's because he was blinded. And a blind person is nechshav kilo like he's like he's dead. So I'd like to propose that maybe the two answers go hand in hand. And maybe being blind is considered like a mace. And maybe mace is being considered blind because Yitzhak didn't have your standard blindness. There were seven reasons why Yitzhak was blind. Right? And this, I think, is also going to explain a bomb question that everybody has for this parsha. If you read the parsha on the surface level, so Yitzhak is a feeble, senile, blind old man who's getting tricked by everybody, right? And he doesn't figure anything out until the very end. That, that's what it looks like in the service level, which is like fear, right? You can't say it. it's Yitzhak Avinu. How could that be? So what's happening? What's happening when Yitzhak Avinu is doing this? Is he really feeble? Is he really blind? So we see, no, he's the highest tzaddik that there could ever be. He was on a higher level than Yaakov, than Avram, than Moshe. He, is, he only had one name, right? It's one name in this world and the next. He had that neshama from the Olam Haba. He was living down here. So what does it mean that he's blind? So perhaps we could say that he had a different set of goggles. He saw the world with x-ray vision. X-ray vision meaning he could see Olam Haba in Olam Hazeh. He could see the next world. Similarly, yeah, he could see the matrix. He could see the letters. He could see what was happening behind the scenes. How do we know this? So the Arizal says that the Pasuk says, That Yitzchak loved Esav because... The literal word means he trapped him with his mouth, or it was trapped in his mouth. So Rashi says, what does it mean? It means that Esav tricked Yitzchak with his words. He trapped him with his mouth. He tricked him with his words. What does Yerizal say? So he says something very, very different. He said, he tied the piv, said there was something trapped in his mouth. What was it? It was a spark of Kedusha. It was the highest level of Kedusha that could be brought into this world. It was actually in Esav and potential. The Midrash says that Esau was supposed to be one of the Avos. So before Avos, he was supposed to marry Leah, and Yaakov was supposed to marry Rachel. He was supposed to have six Shvatim, and Yaakov was supposed to have six Shvatim, right? 
Yitzhak recognized that Esav had this potential. In fact, when Esav was killed, what rolled into the Marana Machvela? His head. Tied by Piv. At that spark of Kedusha that was trapped in his mouth was Zochet to be buried in the Marana Machvela. It actually went in. It actually was buried there. What does that mean he was trapped in his mouth? So Yitzchak saw this unbelievable potential in Esau, a greater potential than existed in Yaakov. And why do you want to give him the bracha? Because he wanted to bring it out. Why didn't he see all the rishus, all the evil that was in Esau? Because he had an Hashem from Olam Haba. He, he didn't see it. He couldn't see it. He only saw potential. He saw the next world. He saw the next world. When we said there's a person up there, there's a person down here. There's an Hashem up there. There's an Hashem down here. He only saw the Hashem up there. When it came to the potential, Esav was greater than Yaakov. In the potential, he had a spark of Kedusha trapped in his mouth. Yitzhak was trying to extract the spark. That's what he was trying to do. And he recognized that in Esav because he had these goggles on, this neshama that was from the next world. It only saw Kedusha, it only saw perfection. Perhaps that's what it means when the Midrash says all seven reasons, right? We'll go through them, right? Angel tears. I don't know how angel tears work, but it could very well be that angel tears, they clarify a person's eyes. They purify a person's eyes. Right? It wasn't his deficiency, it was his perfection that the angel tears actually raised him up to a vision of an angel. Like we saw that he's, he's in a Shema from Olam Haba. He wasn't in this world. In fact, the name Yitzchak, if you rearrange letters, says Tiferes Yisrael, is Ketzchai, the end of life. Like in this world, he was Ketzchai. He was already at the end of life. He was already in Echshav Kemes. As I said, he was like he was dead in this world. Dead meaning that he saw the perfect potential in everything that he looked at. Another reason, because he saw the Shechina. Right? We said one of the reasons, because when you see the Shechina, so you see the world the way it's meant, it's meant to be. You see the potential in every single thing. You see the Kedusha that's hidden, the sparks that are in the, that are in the physicality. Another one we said, because he looked at Esau of Russia. He saw the face of Esau of Russia. It could be, that's not what blinded him, but that's when we see that he's blind. Because when he looks at Esau of Russia, he doesn't see the Russia. He's blinded to the riches of Esau, right? Yeah, because he's blind when he saw Esau of Russia. That's when he went blind, because that's when he couldn't see what everyone else sees in the world, right? The whole story is that everyone else could see. He could not see. So he couldn't see the wickedness of Esav that was happening in the world. Right? All the reasons that we saw, right? That, 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 well, why, why? So another reason Hashem wanted to save him from seeing the wickedness of Esav. This is how he saved him. He was only able to see the good in Esav. He made him blind, right? Blind in a way that his blindness was his perfection. That he let him see everything the way it's meant to be in Olam Haba. And perhaps, perhaps that also fits exactly with the al That's, that, that's, that's, a, an outflow of the fact that he had no Yetzirah, right? Because he had no mission in this world, because he was already in the next world. If you have a mission in this world, right, you have to see the evil in this world, because your whole mission is to fight your Yetzirah. He had no mission. That's why he didn't do anything. That's the question. What was his purpose? What was the pur- purpose of Yitzhak Avin? Why would Hashem put someone in the world when they're literally living in the next world? Very nice. I don't know. This is the deep idea, okay? Deep idea. In Kabbalah, there's two primary midas, right? And there's other ones, two primary. There's chesed on the right and gvura on the left. Abram Vinu was chesed, and Yitzhak we know was gvura. What are these two midas? What is chesed and what is gvura? So chesed is always an outflowing of his chachis, of newness. Chesed is coming from the source. It's, it's creating novel things. Abram was a trailblazer, right? He created a new path in the world. He was all about chesed. He was mekar of everyone. He, he made thousands of converts. It says he was asu neshamas. He made neshamas. Right? He was always moving and doing and accomplishing and conquering and spreading the Torah. What happens if you've ever met a person like that, that they're always conquering, always moving forward? So what happens to all their old projects that they started? Right? They just fall into disrepair. They never see things through. They don't know how to develop it. They can start 20 companies, but they can't run any of them. Right? There's no, no, they can't keep the accounting records. Like nothing really works. It's all broken because they're constantly moving and expanding because chesed always needs a partner. In marriage, the man is always recognized as the chura, chesed, the female is gvura. When they come together to make a child, so the man is there for a minute and the woman takes nine months to develop the baby, to build it, to give it detail, to limit it, and to construct it. Right? That's gvura. Gvura is limiting and constructing. If you only have chesed without gvura, so what do you have? A bolt of lightning. You have potential. It doesn't do anything. You can't accomplish anything. So Avram brought all this newness into the world. What happened to all his converts? He said they all, they all disappeared. They all just went back to Vodazara or their children back to Vodazara. That chesed went nowhere. 
But you don't see those converts ever coming back into the story. Yitzchak was the one who had the koaf to take the chiddush of Avraham and to bring it back into the world and to make it solid, to give it staying power and to develop it. What did he do in the world? Look how beautiful it is. He redug the wells of Avraham Avinu. You think the Torah cares about him digging wells to get water out of the ground? You think that's what it really means? What does it mean to dig a well? It means to create a new path in the world, to create hashpa, to bring spirituality into the world that was concealed before. That was Avram Avinu. What happened to those wells? So like we said, if someone's all chesed, the wells get filled up. No one's taking care of them. They fall into disrepair. Yitzhak Avinu came and he redug the wells. The exact same story. Abimelech, right? Abimelech takes his wife. He says to his sister, everything that happened to Avram happens all over again to Yitzhak. Because what's he doing? He's solidifying the novelty, the chiddush of Avram in the world. That's his whole avoda. He's not in this world, right? He's in the next world. His whole purpose in this world is just to make sure that what Avram brought into the world has staying power. That's his whole midah. That's gvura. That's what he's all about. It's not about creating anything new. That's why he didn't do anything. That's why he didn't need a neshama from this world, right? He didn't need a Yitzhahara because he wasn't supposed to fight and to create. He was supposed to solidify, establish, right? To build what was already there, to just give it more structure, to define it, to give it staying power, right? To bring Yaakov Avinu into the world. That was the whole tafid of Yitzhak. So it's a whole different idea than, than, than we're used to. And we understand now why, he's, why he was blind, right? why he saw the Kedusha, he always saw the potential. And his whole goal in life was to bring out that potential, not to create new things, but to actually make whatever was there have that staying power in the world. So we can learn from Yitzhak a very, very important lesson. Right? There's always two phases in every period of spiritual growth. It's called the Ratzo Veshav, Rabbi Nachman calls it. Ratzo means you're moving forward and you're getting closer to Hashem and you're on fire and you're having a good week and you're learning, you're davening. And that's a gift from Hashem. Total gift. It's called, it's chesed. Right? Then you have the next week where your davening is terrible. You can't concentrate. The learning is not going. You're waking up late. You're making mistakes. And right, nothing's working out. So, what, so, so we think that that week is a failure. Right? <laughs> we all have that week, right? You think that week is a failure. But, but Rabbi Nachman says, you have to be a bucky beratso vishov. He says, you can't just be a bucky, an expert in the rats and going forward, like Avram Avin. You can't just be an expert in conquering and creating and establishing and bringing new things into the world because it's just going to fall into disrepair. You need the gvura. You need to be a bucky bishov. That means in the week that things are difficult, what's Hashem doing? He always lets you take right, two steps forward and then one step back and then two steps forward and one step back. He's showing you new plateaus that you can reach. Then you fall back. And then he says, okay, now you have to work. You have to work. Yeah, as long as you're moving two steps, as I said, one step back, two steps forward, right? As long as you keep moving forward, your trajectory has to be like a stock market, like constantly, sometimes four steps back. Yeah, sometimes many steps back. As long as you're moving forward, you go forward. But that's Yitzhak Avinu. That's showing you that you need those two midas. Without the second midas, like it's Hashem wasted one of the avos, right? So to speak, right? Like this Talmud that said, Yitzhak didn't do anything. Like he wasted, yeah, you think, right? It's needed. It's teaching you that this is so needed that we need this individual that was not even in this world. Hashem didn't even give him any tafkin in this world other than to solidify what Avram Avinu had already established. That was his whole goal in life. And that's the midah that we have to have. So, B'zerat Hashem, we should learn from Yitzhak Avinu, the forgotten Av, the enigmatic Av, the Av that like everybody forgets about. But he essentially may teach us the deepest lesson of all, the most important lesson of all, that even when an individual is not grounded in this world, even when he's floating in the world above, he still has a tafkin. So the tafkit to bring what was already in his chadish, what was rejuvenated and created from Avravinu, to solidify it in the world and build it in the world. And that's how we have to live our own lives. Wow.